Okay, I'm ready. All right, greetings everyone, and welcome to the second video, except this time I am the one recording, and this is, of course, on my channel, but this will also be a response to the first video, just so that way some of you will, can have everything linked and whatnot. Ah, who cares? Okay. Now... <laughs> I'm just enthusiastic to get into this, but all right, we all we we're gonna spread more medieval DC ideas and pitches for you guys and awesomeness and, and absolute awesomeness and hilarity. Okay, now when we last left off, we were gonna probably on the hero side talk about Hawkman, and I actually came up with yeah. one for I him and for him brought, and yeah. Hawk Girl, and. I'll go ahead and get my my interpretation out of the way because holy hell is it long. But okay. Basically for Shire and Carter there would be this small valley near Cairo, near Egypt called the Valley of Thangoria. And basically Thangoria of course being a play on Thanagar, you know, the homeworld that ah. Sh that Shire and Carter come from. Yes. Yeah. And you're gonna laugh. You're gonna simply laugh at this, Ian, because this is almost like right out of a Robert Howard book. Like this whole origin, because because basically instead of Carter, he would be called Carter, and instead of and instead of Shire, it would be Shiora. And I would base Carter, ba I would base him, of course, on Conan, and Shiora would be based on Red Sonia. And. Mm -hmm. The reason why I do this is because they would both be really great warriors, and that you know the Valley of Thangoria they were almost they were basically the Sumerians, but they were also a much more honorable and noble version of the Sumerians. They didn't believe in shedding blood unless it was absolutely necessary, and the Pharaoh, after Moses had parted the Red Sea and freed the Jews, the Pharaoh needed new slaves and so he invaded the and so he raided and pillaged the valley of Thangoria and brought along you know slaves and so Shiora and Carter were two of those slaves so basically and they were they were the slaves to King Ramses basically yes hmm. uh, that's an interesting and that, story and that basically this inventor this tinkerer this like old man that was into alchemy, mechanic, mechanics, and everything else. You know, just a mad thinker, a mad scientist and inventor. He takes pity on them, and so secretly he teaches them the ways of like inventing and all things like science and alchemy and whatnot. And both of, and both of them end up becoming very proficient at it. Yeah. And and basically what they and pretty much. And, pre and originally, I was going to have a part where Shiora basically got, like, raped and beaten by King Ramses, but I feared that that would be too graphic. So I cut that out, as along with the part that, of course, towards the end, she would get revenge by basically making him a eunuch by smashing his, his genitals. But as I said, that was way too graphic. <laughs> but it would still be funny, nevertheless, but way too graphic. But... Yeah. He would be, but basically the, but on his wedding night, because he was going to force Shiora into marriage, there were these two abnormal hawks that King Ramses had, and so that would explain how they, of course, have their hawk helmets. They basically kill and basically cleave the skulls off of these hawks. However, to make them double durable, they are dipped in liquid gold, so they have like these skeletal like these like golden skeletal like hawk helmets these like war helmets and that also the scientist tinkerer had found this rare meteoric ore that when that through vibration whenever it hit something it basically had an electrical discharge no matter, even if it was the slightest of sounds. So basically, Carter helps him cleave it in half, and they forge two giant maces out of out of this. Thus, you know, giving way to the nth metal in the, in of course, you know, the the DCU. 
and that cart and that carter would have basically kind of like mithril like chainmail armor that would cover his chest whereas shiora would have this like lightly armor plated like breastplate that would cover her whole upper body and then they would build these massive mechanical wings and here's where it gets a little over analytical because basically this would be kind of like the prototype basically depending on how tense either one of them flexed like their upper body muscles the more that it would like the more that it would like that it would like basically control their wings like okay say for example Shiora like tensed her upper body muscles to move to the right the wings would actually move with her to the right and if she was like fully relaxed you know she wasn't like tensing any muscles or anything the wings would actually fold back in and they would just they, they would be fine but if say you know she like fully tensed every muscle in like her upper body the wings would just shoot out and sure. and you know and the more tense her muscles and the more tense her muscles get the wider the wings spread out so it would so there would almost be kind of like this like motion sensor like primitive technology where depending on like how tense or how much they actually flexed their muscles like how tense it got, the more it would kind of control the wings. Like that's at least the way that I would look at it. I well, realize that it sounds they would a little goofy. Pretty goddamn physically fit in order to. Uh, you oh, know. they would be very fit. Hmm. I'm just, they hey. would be very fit. Yeah, I'm just saying though, they would have to be incredibly like muscular and physically fit to be able to like control their uh, their muscle mass that way. Oh, they would be because basically in the in the Valley of Thangoria, basically both the males and females, especially if the females wanted to be warriors, they would have to train rigorously. And I mean rigorously. Yeah, I don't from childbirth up, huh? Yeah, kind of like one of those like from childbirth up type deals, and that basically, and then of course they would fly off, and then at some point they would become you know like. A soldiers of fortune type deal like they would become guns for hire or like mercenaries and one funny shot that I thought of and you and Ian are gonna laugh at this zip but I thought of a, like a planet Hulk moment for like manhawk as I call them they would be called lady hawk and manhawk kind of reversing you know instead of Hawkman it's manhawk very very tribal-esque name and manhawk would basically have like this epic like planet Hulk moment because you know how Hulk in the, in, in the Planet Hulk DVD, that one monster, they set it up to be indestructible, and with one punch, the Hulk just, like, collapses its brain and kills it? Yeah, yeah. Carter would have a moment like that with a, with a medieval dragon, where it would, like, breathe fire, all these other mercenaries are getting whipped around and stuff. Carter just looks at it, leaps up, flies with his wings, and just, boom, hits the one hit of the mace, and just like actually cracks the dragon's skull open and smashes its head straight into the ground. He would have to, yeah, that would make sense because Carter and Shire would both be insanely strong. Well, I would, well, I pronounce it Shiora, but yeah, it's or like they would be in, intensely strong. Like, of course, you know, Carter would be the would be the stronger of the two. Not that I'm being sexist, but I'm just saying. You know, it's I like gotcha. yeah. I think Shiora would uh would definitely Oh more than oh make no mistake, she would more than be able to hold her own. I mean there would be I mean, she would probably be able to go toe to toe with she would be at least be able to hold her own for a little bit against like Dark Saeed. Like not a whole lot, but just at least like a little bit. Like she'd be like Wonder Woman level tier. In terms of she, she would basically be like on the same tier level as Diana in this continuity. Okay. Yeah, like she would be very fierce. She would, be, she, you know, she would be buff enough that she would be strong, but she would be more like. Whereas Carter would be stronger, she would be a lot more agile and nimble. Like you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I got you. Yeah. Like that's the way that I would work it, and then and, and a hawk man would he would just or man hawk as you call him he would just be he would just be retardedly strong. 
Oh yeah, he would like throw boulders like He Man style. Yeah, he would. He would. He would easily like be. He would easily be able to match uh, Superman. That is when well, Superman's not even trying. When Superman's at his weakest, he would be able to uh, match Carter. Oh yeah. Okay. And but and basically, um, and I think. Another idea that I had was basically, as I was telling you guys, you know, Paladin Fate. Kenton Nelson, Ramakrishna would basically come to him in a vision, a dream. And Ramakrishna would tell him of this champion that he or she had, which was a powerful necromancer named named Nabu. And that Nabu was a very... Was a very noble and wise necromancer and that and that you know he was so faithful to Ramakrishna that Nabu's spirit his essence his power was sealed within both his staff and his helmet and can and that basically the top and basically that Nabu's battle staff the top of it would be shaped like an onk and it would have a blue ruby in it and yeah. that is, and that his helmet would have little like runic symbols and stuff in it, and that when Kenton Nelson puts on the helmet, he is nearly overwhelmed by like massive visions. Like one vision, as I was talking about, is that in a time of great vulnerability, Sir Jordan of the Order of Emerald Knights would be possessed by the by the by this like entity of pure fear and terror. You know, th this demon lord called Parallax. And that and he would destroy. Parallax and that he would, is the son of. He's not the son of, but I will get to that here in a minute. Oh. But he, but he would basically be. He would basically destroy all of the order. But Knight Commander Scott, yes, I would have Alan Scott in this continuity be the Knight Commander of the you know Order of Emerald Knights. Mm, I like and that. that yeah. And and that. And that he saves one ring, and, and that he saves one ring, and that this ring ha finds a helpless, a helpless, sad sack esque bard called Chiron Rayner, who would act, who would basically be the one hope again, one hope. However, in this vision, he would also be assisted by a knight of the future, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But basically. As Ian was trying to point out, basically Parallax, the way I would do Parallax is that Parallax would be, he would basically be kind of like a Mephisto Blackheart thing. He would basically, basically, he would be an entity, a quote-unquote son created by the HP Love, by HP Lovecraft's mystical monster, Cthulhu. And Cthulhu you know, towards the end of his life, knowing that he was dying, he wanted to leave behind a legacy, someone that would take up his mantle. So he took all the fear, terror, paranoia, and whatnot in the world, and he created a being in his image that when you saw it, much like Kasulu himself, it would inspire great terror, great fear. You would be paralyzed. And thus, you know, Parallax would be, in a sense, like the embodiment of Kusulu himself, and and then and then also in this and and basically the hero of this future would actually be Booster Gold or my version at least of Booster Gold. And in my version of Booster Gold, he is basically from the future, a future that is very much like a Victorian steampunk era. And so he would have this solar-powered, like, set of armor that he could channel UV rays so intensely that they would almost be like laser beams shooting out of his gauntlets, and that he had a, a robotic assistant called Skeets that basically got badly damaged and that his memory core, the only thing left intact of him was his memory core, and, you know, Booster in this uh, boost, although uh, he, although I wouldn't really call him Booster, I would either call him like Lord Gold or Lord. I would call him Lord Matthew Carter. I'll just call him that for now. So Lord Matthew Carter ends up taking this old ham radio that he had, 
And originally I was going to have Skeets just be like this young teenage boy that spoke through a, a an old ham radio, but then I thought, you know, I would rather have him be, be like, I would have okay. him, I would actually have him be a robotic assistant that didn't quite make it. He got like basically screwed up through the wormhole, and the only thing that was left was his memory core. And so he takes the old ham radio and modifies it and basically attaches like a, and, and attaches Skeets' memory bank and whatnot into this old ham, modified ham radio and that he basically like implants it onto his armor so basically skeets is basically this old ham radio that is actually attached to his armor and so and also i thought just for shits and giggles i would actually have him talk kind of like alfred in the old 90s animated series and whatnot or even like the 60s on west tv show like this very like posh british man who kind of talks very gentlemanly kind of like this. Well, I'm not really doing it. I'm doing a very bad British accent, but I'm... But you, Pretty good, I'm, sir. Yeah, kind of like that. Like, like, <laughs> that, like, just imagine that. You know, it's it's like, you know, I say, sir, yes, was, that, was that really necessary? Uh, was that really necessary? Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, kind of yeah, like that, and... And it's like, you know, but then again, that's just my version of Booster. If any of you guys, you know, want to have your own ideas for how a medieval Booster would be around, you know, don't hesitate to put it in the comments. I would love to hear yeah. people's I, ideas on that. Maybe yeah. you guys want me to explain my ideas for Clayface and Gorilla Grodd? Yes. All right. Yeah. I love how you said yes. Okay. Uh, basically, <laughs> basically my, ideas for, my idea for Gorilla Grodd, not Gorilla Grodd, for Clayface. I'm actually going to... I can't remember who the guy who was who commented on Zips on the first video, but I'm basically going to take a page out of his ideas, and I would make it so that this Clayface would actually be Matt Hagen, the third Clayface in the comics, but he would be a German actor, and he would go by the name of Matt Hagen. And uh, basically... He would he would be a very successful uh, stage actor in Germany. However, he would a his role would actually be replaced by his role in this certain play, which is like a horror suspense play. He, it would be replaced by another actor, a different actor named ba Basil Carlo, and Hagen would be really pissed off by this, and he would just murder not only Carlo but all the other actors who actually auditioned to replace Hagen's role. And he's imprisoned, and he's kidnapped by this Satan-worshipping cult who uh, ki who murder him in a human sacrifice, but then they use the powers of Satan, or I guess whatever demons, whoever all the demons were, and they would use it to place his soul inside of this enormous uh, golem, this enormous clay or stone or whatever figure you know this huge like clay statue and his he would reawaken inside of that body he would be he would become this huge clay golem and then that would be he would be known as clayface and he would be sort of the instrument of death for this cult that's basically my idea for clayface now for my idea for a Gorilla Grodd, my idea for Gorilla Grodd is a bit strange, but I, th I think it's kind of cool. Uh, basically, Gorilla Grodd would be Aztec. He would be this Aztec uh, criminal, I guess. He would be like this Aztec criminal who would be sacrificed to uh, this Aztec Gorilla God named Grodd. And, of course, you know how the Aztecs love to perform human sacrifices, and his sacrifice was very brutal and painful. And, uh, the, and Grodd, the gorilla god, basically was very uh, happy and satisfied with just how evil and you know, malicious and just, just how disgustingly ruthless this man was. So he rewards him because Grodd is a very evil, evil god. He rewards him by reincarnating this man as a super strong uh, gorilla monster. He's basically an incredibly strong and intelligent gorilla who happens to have the man's uh, the man's same soul and consciousness. And he would be 
he would be like the, uh, and he would rebel against the Aztecs, and he would go on this worldwide conquest as like Grodd, you know, the gorilla conqueror or something like that. That's my idea for Grodd, basically. Hmm. You got any hey. ideas, Zip? You guys want me to do my turn Red Tornado, my uh, Dick Grayson and uh, Robin stuff? Yeah, talk about okay, those. Okay, um, for the Red Tornado, basically how I would have it is, how I explain it is, I didn't really think it out too much, but basically something happens in his past. Something, uh, he gets cursed with something in his real name, uh, Red, Tornado, Red Tornado's real name, I think is John Smith. So I would change yeah, it to John Smith. Jonathan something some type of medieval last name so basically his skin will be really hard it kind of like how the absorbing man's skin is when he absorbed thor's hammer like his skin would be that hard and he would basically have the same powers and i would call him the red um champion uh i was thinking red i mean tornado champion but i was thinking tornado tyrant but that sounds a little bit too evil but yeah, he would, that's... one of the elementals, he would have a connection to, like, um, Firestorm in a way, since Firestorm in this uh, universe, I believe, is a elementals as well. And there will be other um, ones, because Red Tornado is not the only one in the DC universe, if you don't know about the character. There's, I believe there's um, the Red Rocket and stuff like that. So he would have other brothers and sisters that he didn't know about in this universe, like the... I don't know, lightning, elementals, one can explode or something like that. So that's basically my idea for Red Tornado. He would be the tornado champion in here. Um, but the other idea I had was for Robin and Nightwing and um, Jason Todd, too. Basically, Nightwing would Nightwing and uh, Tim would be brothers. Tim and Dick Grayson would be brothers in this uh, continuity. And they would hear these stories about when Kal-El, or um, is that what we're calling him in this universe, Kal-El? Yeah, or it yeah. could just be known as Kal-El, a.k.a., you know, the Superman, the the guy who inspires, like, the uh, philosophical ideal. Yeah, right. Kal, you know, Kal-El, the Superman, or right. something like that. So basically, they would hear stories about this great speech that he gave, and one of the things that he mentioned in there was these two birds, the Red Robin and the Nightwing. And basically, in this universe, the Joker, a.k.a. the Jester, would kill their parents, and they would basically use the inspirations from Kal-El's story, and they would become the warriors known as Nightwing and Red Robin. But they would have, like, a bastard brother known as, of course, Jason. He would be Jason in this universe. I don't know the last name because Todd, that doesn't sound very medieval. But uh, he would be inspired in a way kind of like what Deathstroke is in this universe. And he would be, like, the killer. Uh, he would go around killing in the goddamn, I, I believe it's called, in this universe. He would be the person who would overstep the boundaries, so to speak, that the Dark Knight is not able to do. Uh, I was thinking maybe we could talk about the uh, Barbara Gordon and all those other characters, but basically... It's funny. Because Ian came up with the idea that uh, the Dark Knight, Bruce would have like a one-night stand with Talia, and they would have this kind of bastard son, Damian Wayne. And that's kind of the idea I came up with for the other Batman. Actually, the members. way that Ian and I were actually talking about Jason Todd when you went away is that basically he would have Altair from Assassin's Creed 1's personality. He would be very cold and calculating, but that he would have all the arsenal and fighting movesets of, like, Ezio from Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood and whatnot. Like, he would have, like, hidden blades, and he would have, like, little, like, small, like, gunpowder, like, pistol units on, like, you know, his attachments and stuff, and he would have, like, hidden throwing daggers and stuff. Like, he would literally be, like, arm, he would literally be, like, a walking arsenal, kind of like the Dark Knight, but that he would, he would basically be more of, like, an assassin. Right, there you go. And that his skills would actually match even that of Slade's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, because, yeah, well, my question is, would any of, would Nightwing, Red Robin, and Jay, and uh, Red Hood, 
would they all be related to uh, the Dark Knight, to Batman in this continuity? Uh, not by blood, but they will, like, eventually meet him and, like, follow him and whatnot. But I wouldn't have him related by blood. No. That's, oh, I, I mean, well, that's I not really what I meant. Bruce, I think in this continuity, that would make Bruce a little bit too much like of a... Well, technically, I, I don't know. That could work. He could be like a... I don't know, a sex fanatic yeah, or something. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what somebody put in the comments on, on the last video, and it's like, you know, I really wasn't digging that idea too much, to be honest. Nah, me neither. Yeah, but However... I think, that, I think that would make him, like, too much of a, like, hypocrite, in my opinion, but... Yeah, it would make him too unlikable. Yeah. Um, I actually came up with an I I actually came up with an idea for at least I got one basic concept for Starfire although it's not much of a concept but it's a basic outline that people can probably tinker around with in their minds okay as apparently I found out from pop culture divas you know who has the best cleavage video she was talking about how you know Starfire's abilities one of her abilities is that her powers derived from the Sun and that the more skin that's exposed, the more, like, UV rays she can soak up. And so I was thinking, what if, in this continuity, Firestar, or not, I always, I keep wanting to say Firestar, Starfire, I mean, what if she actually comes from a race of volcanic sprites that can actually harness, that can actually harness the power of the sun? And... However, my idea for Beast Boy, this one's a little bit more fantastical. This is like Lord of the Rings stuff right here, as I would call it. Oh, excuse me. Basically, wouldn't Beast be, Boy... I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but wouldn't it, wouldn't it be interesting if they call him just the Changeling? Um, yeah, that's true. That, that is... is actually true. I guess the Changeling, I guess, is what we'll call him in this continuity. Let me interrupt you again. I actually think Changeling would be a would be a much more appropriate name for like the medieval setting. Well, yeah. I'm calling him Beast Boy as like a substandard, but yeah, in terms of actual name, yeah, the Changeling would work. And basically, the Changeling, he would be like he would be like a crossbreed. Basically, he would be like half wood nymph and half human, and that. And that basically he is considered by both the human and wood nymph sides to be an abomination. And neither side really fully accepts him. However, the first time he saves the wood nymphs from poachers. And he had a fascination with animals. And so through an ancient ritual... He asks them if he can be bonded to be able to become any animal in nature that he sees. And they are very unsure if he can handle, you know, this power and use it for righteous reasons. Because usually the wood nymphs in this continuity would just become like trees just to throw off hunters and whatnot. And the eldest of the council, he sees a great deal of good in changeling and so what he and, and so basically when the poachers come back as they're performing the ritual, he ends up pulling kind of like an Obi Wan Kenobi from Star Wars, where he uses his own life force to basically finish up the ritual and sacrifices himself, and then Changeling turns into a giant bear and scares off the poachers. However, he feels guilty because you know this this person, this old man basically gave his life so that he could live on and that the ritual can be complete and so it was there that he makes a vow that he is going to use his powers for good and for the good of humanity and unfortunately and painfully his father tells him you know hey with these powers now you're really not going to be accepted and some pn you know a lot of devout christians end up basically trying to kill him and it is then that he actually finds, that he not only finds and gets rescued by, but he ends up, you know, regrettably and forcefully joining a band of travelers known as the Doomed Wanderers. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by the Doomed Wanderers, that would be basically the medieval version in my, con at least in my continuity, my mind, that would be my version of the Doom Patrol. 
So basically, Changeling would be going with the first superhero team that he was a part of before becoming part of the Teen Titans. At least the Teen Titans. In okay. And, all right. Now, I actually want to get the idea of, of Neuron out of the way. Which one of you came up with the idea for Neuron? I did. Yeah, it was you. But, uh, could I, uh, do you want to explain it, Steve, or do you mind if I explain it? What, the part with neur what, the part with Neuron? Yeah. Dude, since, dude, if, since it's your idea, and I don't even know how the hell to even, to even try to explain it, I would rather that you do it. Alrighty. Okay, basically my idea for Neuron is a bit different, but basically... What I have in mind for Neron is that, first of all, Neron would, uh, he would not originally be a demon, but he would be a, a human, but he would be Japanese. He would be this insane, cruel, absolutely barbarous uh, Japanese war warlord named uh, uh, Kendo Naranichi, and he would die in battle, but then he would his soul would actually be uh, captured by Trigon, who who pretty much remakes him into an immortal vampi vampiric uh, demon lord, and he renames himself Neron. Now, basically, my idea... If there was any other character I would compare Neron to, I would compare him to uh, Nobunaga Oda from the Onimusha games. He would be this... He would just be this immortal, unkillable, unstoppable, uh, sort of vampiric, really terrifying demon god, sort of, like. And he would just have all these different forms, and he would be really influential and really persuasive, you know, very and actually very uh, seductive, you know, pretty much just like the regular Neuron that we know from DC, from the regular DC Universe. And he would actually tie in to a uh, to and in, in terms of and it in terms of Japanese, shall we say, mythology for this part of the DCU. He would actually, and I just thought of this, and this would be really great, is that he would actually be the one who influences Lady Katana to actually rebel against her father. And take you know the ancient family sword that has been passed down from generation to generation, and that he would also, and that he would also kind of along the way, you know, he would basically be the guy who basically kind of messes with Bushido's head, you know, as he's trying to break up these you know Eurasian like, you know, like child and woman like sex like sex slave rings and stuff. Or like these, you know, slavery rings. He would be sitting there taunting Bushido because Bushido, in this continuity, would be the heir, would be the son of a feudal lord, and that Katana, in this continuity, would be his sister. And that he's not only looking for Katana, but that he also has a new purpose in trying to go on a pilgrimage, a coming of age pilgrimage, to prove to his father that he can lead, that he can lead, you know, their clan. And so on and so forth. However, he has a hard time tracking Katana because she is part of the Dark Knight's mercenary group, this secret covert mercenary group that he has called the Outsiders, along with Sir Jefferson Pierce, or as they call him by his surname, the Black Lightning. And he, uh, part of that name is that he could actually literally harness and shoot lightning, not only out of his fingertips, but he had the lightning strike which was this special saber made for him that when he used his electrical powers he could basically veil or completely cover the sword in nothing but pure like electricity so it looked like when he slashed at someone like that he was slashing them with like pure with like pure electricity or pure lightning and the, and one of the crazy stories that was once told by a peasant a farmer is that is that once when Mara when raiders came to try to destroy a village that basically their 
one of the raider the raiders leader who happened to be a who happened to be a small time sorcerer who dabbled a little bit in black magic he tried to strike down pierce with a lightning bolt and that using the lightning strike sword he actually cleaved a cleaved the lightning bolt that went to strike him in half and so that would kind of set up the fact that of course black lightning in this continuity is a badass <laughs> <laughs> but that it would also but that it would also make it would also make of course people think twice about challenging Pierce and that also I will I'll probably get into Metamorpho a lot later but Metamorpho would also be part of that group and in terms of Owlman and many of the other like old or new like outsiders characters they wouldn't really be in this unless, of course, you guys can come up with a good way to really kind of explain their origins. But I would just have it with Katana, Metamorpho, and Black Lightning. Kind of like in Brave and the Bold, just those three. But I'm trying to think. I had an I idea. Guess... For, uh... oh, okay, go ahead. Well, actually, no. What was your idea? I was going to say I had an idea for Lobo. <clears throat> Oh, now this I have to hear. How would you make Lobo fit? Um, basically, the idea is that um, he's like this continuity's version of a Nephilim. If you don't know what a Nephilim is, they're like a mix between, uh, in Christianity, they're like a um, mix between the angel and the human. And they oh, were like these wait. giant men. I know what you're And saying. basically, they will be called um, the, Vel the Vel... What was this race called? Velorpians? And... He would basically be this um, star child of the Velopian race. And uh, they would really look up to him, and uh, they would be like, he's the strongest out of all of us. But one day, just for the fuck of it, like Lobo did in the regular universe, he would kill them all off. And he would do it just to prove how strong he is. He would be kind of like Cain. And like how how kind of like the Cain and Abel thing, he would be Cain, and he would go after Cal El. He would be like, I want to challenge you, and I want to show you just how strong I am, just to fight you for the fuck of it, because he's Lobo, and that's pretty much how I would do him in this universe. Actually, and this may I mean, actually he would be known like I don't know, I guess the Omega Men or something like that, Velopians. Yeah. I guess that's accurate. Yeah, like something like that. Yeah. I'm actually going to I'm actually going to knock out two characters of the supernatural origin in the DCU and that is the Phantom Stranger and the Spectre. Now, uh, yeah. This is going to be a little this is going to be kind of a little lengthy, kind of like the Lady Hawk and Manhawk deal. Okay. Basically during the Heaven Wars there were two angels that did not fight for Lucifer or against him. And so as punishment, one basically was sent to live among humanity and he was more of an observer. You know, he was kind of like a champion of humanity. And there was another one who was kind of like a black angel. That was his brother. So the Spectre and the Phantom Stranger in this continuity would be brothers. And that basically the specter would be this dark angel and that he would have to inhabit a host in order to learn humility this was kind of his punishment by by god and in gotham the you know this continuity's version of gotham a young lieutenant knight named joseph corbin not Corbin, but Corrigan, Joseph Corrigan. I was about to say. I know. I like us. I, I knew I was going to do that too. Hmm. But Joseph Corrigan would pretty much be betrayed by some of Lord Wayne's like personal guard. There would be like corrupt knights. And that, and that they would be bribed by an Italian kind of like, you know, crime lord. And that Corrigan's spirit cries out for vengeance and justice, and the specter basically inhibits his body. And when the specter takes over his body, okay, the way his armor would look, 
is that he would have this this like really dark but still angelic looking like green and white armor and that he would have this long cloakish like druid this like long like druid co- dru yeah take two this druid cloak to where he would have this ghoulish appearance but all you would see is just like the top ha- the top half of his face would be covered but you would see these glowing green eyes and that you would still see like and that you would still see like his mouth and and what have you so he would have this long kind of like green druid kind of like cloak and you know what have you and that he would be really powerful he would basically be like you know the spirit of vengeance literally like God's right hand man kind of like he is in the comics but that also the you know the phantom as I would call him the phantom you know the phantom stranger his brother God would basically make him his keeper so they would travel around together and that the phantom's only job by God is to bit is to basically make sure that the specter does not cross the un shall we say the un <coughs> the unethical boundary if you will like if he takes his punishing you know criminals way too far and basically the way I would make the Phantom Stranger look in this continuity have either one of you two play the game Eternal Champions uh no I haven't I haven't either. Okay, for those of you who have actually played the Eternal Champions game, you'll know what I'm talking about. He will look like he will look like the Warlock Xavier. He would have like this long kind of like lightish or this like light this like like dark blue but not like dark dark blue. Kind of like a very like I'm trying to think of the I I I can always think of the color of the color later. But he would have kind of like these druidish warlock like robes that he would wear and of course the top half of his face would be kind of lightly covered however on occasion he would take the hood off and he would just have like these milk this like pure like white eyes he would have no pupils or anything but he would just have like these white eyes but he would have but he would actually have like the but he would actually have kind of like this Se- you know, semi like short length, like brown hair. So he would look very human in appearance, but he would have like a human slash divine type look to him, despite these these like druid esque robes that he wears. And <clears throat> he would, and of course, he would carry just like a. Re- it would look like a regular walking stick, but it would be like you know his staff, and what have you. So it that's at least like somewhat I guess you can say my basic interpretation for now of both the Phantom Stranger and the Spectre. Now I'm going to move on to Raven. Yes, my version of Raven is pretty simple. Um she would basically be of course the daughter of Trigon and a human mother. And that basically Christians basically burned her and her mother at the stake, or tried to, because they believed in rich in witchcraft. Because Raven all her life had to wear a hood or something to cover her forehead, because on her forehead were demonic markings, which was basically as they called it the mark of Trigon. And basically, whenever Raven gets upset or becomes too prideful or angry and what have you the demonic parts of her blood kind of overwhelm her because she doesn't know how to control them so she ends up not only killing this whole entire village and euthanizing it but by the time she puts out the fire it's already too late her mother has died from shock from being burned alive so she is orphaned and alone however to make a however Sir Kenton Nelson, or Paladin Fate, as he's known as, he would sense a great evil in this girl, but he would also sense a great. He would he would be very foreboding about taking about taking her with them. But Lady Zatanna's like, you know, look, we can train this girl to be our apprentice, and we can teach her to master these abilities. And so, 
she becomes paladin fate and leads Zatanna's apprentice. And they they basically teach her to control and even be able to harness the demonic powers and magic that she is able to wield. And basically during a storyline that I dubbed the Black Death Saga, which I'll get into in a little bit, she basically is trained by both of them to har not only harness her powers, but to eventually, on uh, you know, just in case Trigon actually is released upon this realm, that she would be at least partially prepared to face her own father. And Trigon, the way that I put it, is that he would be the bastard son of Fishnu. So that would so as you can tell, I'm kind of really deep, really going deep into kind of like the H.P. Lovecraft esque kind of like stuff, to really kind of give these demonic characters, or at least a few of them, a really kind of cool but really kind of sinister edge. And to get into the Black Death Saga, one of the major villains of that is Eclipso. Now my version of Eclipso. He would be an evil djinn, an evil genie, and that he, and that instead of a black diamond, he was sealed in this demonic-looking black lamp, and that when he was freed, he basically pillaged and rummaged through the land. He caused an eclipse. He helped Father Blood. Yes, this version of of Brother Blood would be a satanic, you know, like anti-Christian like cultist and he would have this group and they would basically worship Trigon because he would have visions and he would be grant and he was granted powers by Trigon and so Eclipso would help would help Father Blood raise Trigon out of an interdimensional portal but then they would also help Dark Saeed they would help release you know his god Apocalypse so basically every demonic entity or character that you can think of including Neuron they all basically cause like the end of days times ten. Like we're talking the fabric of reality is fucking tearing itself to pieces. Hmm. And that and that literally it's gonna take the whole medieval like League of Justice, Brotherhood of Justice, the Round Table of Justice, every single justice character <laughs> has to has to fight all these demonic characters. And that basically Eclipso, on top of that, really cre is the one that creates the bubonic plague, the Black Death. However, what is nullified from the history books, quote unquote, in this continuity is that the Black Death did not just kill people very horribly and tremendously, but brought them back as zombies. Jesus. Hell. <laughs> yeah, le oh. yeah, le like like these demonic zombies, kind of like that... this continuity version is a blackest night. Basically, yeah. Oh, okay. that's an interesting way to look at it. Okay, I like that. Oh, would yeah. yeah, but would they would Black Hand be involved in any ways? Because like, um, you know, that's actually something Ian that I'm still tinkering around with is how to introduce Black Hand into this medieval continuity. Because Black Hand was sort of the catalyst for the whole Blackest Night uh, yeah, but... thing, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's why I'm just saying that it would be an event. Maybe Black Hand could actually be the guy that frees Eclipso. Okay, uh, yeah. That would be cool. And that, and that basically, what would make it even better is that Eclipso would basically grant Black Hand, you know, great tremendous power, and that basically Black Hand would almost be kind of like, you know, the, shall we say, Grand Master of this massive Black Death-esque, like, zombie army. Like, he would be almost kind of like this necromancery general. Hmm. Like, that would be able to work, I think, wouldn't it? Yeah, he, he would still have, like, his obsession with death and all that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I can, I can like, go with that. Yeah, like, that, that could probably definitely work. But it's just, when I thought about that, I thought, you know what? If I'm going to go with the Black Death and I'm going to introduce it, it's like, you know, i got to make it in, like, a big-ass way. And I thought, what if all, like, the demon gods and whatnot of, like, this medieval continuity just 
they all, I mean, just all hell breaks loose. And that literally, and then as, and then as if you, as if you didn't think that that was enough, not only that, but basically Parallax, he would actually still have possession of Sir Jordan. So imagine how that fight's going to play out. Yeah, okay. Damn, we got to yeah, figure out how yeah. you're going to introduce uh, Sinestro. You know, huh. actually, that's something that I'm still t trying to tinker around with. Yeah. Cause... Like, like, actually, you know, like, one basic interpretation is that Sinestro, he would actually end up being, he would end up actually being a champion for Parallax. Like, basically, pa like, basically, Parallax, like, basically, he would be this city elf. Okay, here's a basic interpretation, and it's not, I didn't quite fully think it out. Oh, but, okay. I like the but, idea of making him an elf, though. That's, that's cool. Yeah, like, uh, like, he would be, like, he would be, like, so Sinestro would, is, so would the, his home, so, like, he would come from, like, this, uh, city, this fantastical city called Korrigar or something? Yeah, like, he would come from a fantastical city, and he comes to, say, like, Gotham or something, like, one of the big cities, you know, because, you know, his people are traveling because, you know, they've outrun their resources and whatnot. However, that's the cover story. The cover story is that he was actually a thief and a tyrant and that he tried to take over, then they tried to take over that land and that I would definitely keep play in the Green Lantern part of it because he would be a member of the Order of Emerald Knights and when Knight Commander Scott hears that he's abusing his power, let's just say for Sinestro, that, you know, the shit hits the fan. Mm. Because then he has a lot of stuff to answer to. And it's then that Parallax actually forges for him a ring that can basically, be, the more, you know, the more somebody induces fear and terror on the populace the stronger their constructs and rings are so it'd be kind of so the yellow fear rings would be more supernatural in origin but but if you want to talk about more more green lantern stuff i came up with a concept for the Manhunters. oh i came up with one kind of just recently with the for uh, atrocities but go ahead okay I would they would be called the hunters of man and that basically they would be these kind of trans transgender-ish eunuchs however they would not however <laughs> yeah I know it's a little kind of messed up but they would basically they were originally hired by Knight Commander Scott or at least the previous Knight Commander of the Order of Emerald Knights to basically be, you know, like bodyguards, like they would, they like they were a mercenary group that worked with the worth uh, with that worked with the Order of Emerald Knights. However, the however the previous Knight Commander, before Knight Commander Scott, he actually he actually witnessed them. He witnessed like tiny bands of them because they would put on a show that yeah we were being noble and we've arrested these criminals however what they realized is that some of these criminals they weren't being arrested or being brought to justice that rather the hunters of man were actually de they were being judge jury and executioner and yeah. and the knight commander before scott did not agree with this what, what, and, what, what, what if the knight commander was a guardian like in the, would the guardians in this universe be like I, I guess elves too? That's um, an interesting. They would actually be dwarves. Yeah, dwarves. Okay. I was just dwarves. about to say. I did be... not actually think about that, but yeah, Dampen. you could make the Maybe guardians like Dampen dwarves. Dwarves. You know, that actually reminds me. I just thought of an idea for John Stewart, but I'll let you get through with what you're saying. Actually, let, you know what's funny? I'll let Zip. Is that is that John Stewart Dwarf. is actually in this continuity, because when because when Paladin Fate sees the Order of Emerald Knights actually being destroyed by, you know, Sir Jordan, who's been possessed by Parallax, one of the Emerald Knights that he supposedly in this vision actually destroys and kills is, you know, Sir, is actually Sir Jonathan Stewart. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so Jon Stewart would be in there, but he would probably be, like, more in a flashback sequence. Or, like, he would be vaguely shown as, like, a cameo or something. Really? Because I, I had, I had a, whole, a whole idea for his backstory. Okay. Okay, go. I don't know, because... Uh, basically, I had I just had an idea that Jon Stewart would, uh, he would actually be British. But the thing is, he would be, like, he would be the a, the son of, like, two African slaves that were on board of, uh, that were on a, uh, that were actually on board a Black Manta's pirate ship. And, uh, yeah, Black Manta would be so evil that he would enslave his own race of people, but he would actually, but he would actually be rescued by Aquaman, and he would go to, uh, live as a teenager in England. And, uh, because of this, and he would be recruited by uh, by Sir Jordan to be one of the Emerald Knights. That's okay. Good. That could actually that that actually sounds pretty awesome. And while I'm thinking of it, before I actually forget, I came up with a concept for Wildcat. And ooh, are you, could, this one's going to be interesting? Maybe Wildcat could be Scottish or something. Oh no, I actually have it pretty much etched in my mind how it, how it would be. And you're going to find this kind of funny and ironic because, okay, instead of Ted, you know, Ted's not a medieval name, so I would probably call him Thaddeus Grant or Theo or even like Leo for short. Or Theodore. Yeah, Theodore. Yeah, that, that's all of those names are great. Anywhere works. Well, I well I would call him Thaddeus Grant because he would be Roman. He would be a Roman gladiator who fought in the Colosseums, and that he would actually be speaking out against the Roman emperor. What would, and he, that be, the, would he be immortal or something? Do what? Would he be immortal or something? Well, hold on. Let me get through explaining this. Okay. He would basically be speaking out against the Roman Emperor, and the Roman Emperor didn't like this because the people were starting to side with Thaddeus. And he would try to, and he basically would have him framed for murder because, I'm trying to think, what's the actual proper name for those, like, like brass-knuckled gauntlets that... Uh, wrote? Cestus? Yes, he would have these two, and, st he, and he would be legendary in the Colosseum, because he wouldn't fight with a sword or shield or anything. He would fight with cestuses. However, one of his cestuses, since they were spiked, they put poison on there, and he actually killed his opponent. And so, after, and so he, while he's framed, he takes his cestuses, and he grinds off the, you know, the spiked bits of it. So they're just as round as, say, like, you know, the knobs on Hellboy's Hand of Doom, you know, that kind of circular... Oh damn, that's cool. Okay. And and that basically he flees Rome. He flees he flees, you know, like Rome, but one day while he's camping out on the run, and you know, he is actually visited and here's where it gets fantastical. Are you ready for this? He is visited by the goddess of the hunt Artemis, who tells him to seek a, to go up to go up to the mountains right near say like the Himalayas or something and he has to fight this near unkillable panther nobody's been able to beat it kill it etc so Thaddeus having nothing to lose he goes to find this panther and Artemis gives him one rule you cannot skin or kill the panther just subdue it and take you know patches of its fur so he gets into a fight with this panther, and after a long struggle and, you know, nearly being killed, Thaddeus manages to basically, basically render the panther unconscious, and he cuts off, you know, patches of fur, and then Artemis tell, and then Artemis, as a disembodied voice, tells him, you know, okay, now, basically, like glue it or attach it to, like, you know, your to like your helmet and your and like you know your cestuses and like you know basically like parts of you know his outfit and he would be and of course he would and of course he would call himself the wildcat because that's what because that's what many of his opponents used to jokingly call him 
because he would strike with the ferocity of a lion, but he would move as as gracefully as say like a cheetah or a mountain lion or something, and that he and that he would basically call himself that. And basically, the way that I would have Thaddeus set up is that he would be the equivalent of King Leonidas from 300. Mix. I'm trying to think here. It would be like King Leonidas from 300. And Troy. Um. Damn, I can't remember the name of it. Maybe oh, it'll come no. back to me later on. But anyway, please. Kratos. Do what? Achilles. Kratos. Uh, Hercules. Oh wait, that. Well, actually, no. Kratos. I guess you could say he's kind of built like Kratos. What about Hercules? He's kind of more like. He's kind of built more like Kratos, but he didn't have the attitude. I mean, I just, I, I, it'll come back to me at some point, guys, and if it doesn't, oh well. But he would basically be like this really great, like very robust, like Roman gladiator of sorts. Hmm. And that he would, but anyway, he had all, he had basically the tufts of fur attached to like, you know, his, his helmet and all that stuff. And Artemis comes to him and, and basically tells him that, you know, these patches of fur that he's got in his costume, basically, the fur of this panther, it basically, those who actually attach it to their costume or are within contact of it, they are granted nine lives. So basically, that's where the whole him having nine lives like a cat would come in. So that allows him to live for a ridiculously long time. Um... More or less, kind of, yes. Okay. I, I, I can buy that in this universe. Yeah, and that basically I, and that basically, he actually ends up dethroning the Roman emperor. However, you know, when he goes back to Rome, he is basically surrounded. However, here's here, you're going to laugh at the cheese of this, because Wildcat's origins would basically come after Sir Garrick is found by Bartholomew Allen, this version of... Yeah. Of like Barry Allen, hmm. and that basically you would have Sir Garrick, Knight Commander Scott, who is basically investigating, you know, some things in Rome, and meeting with you know the Pope and stuff, and then you would have Paladin Fate in town, basically along with Raven and Lady Zatanna, basically helping cure children you know, of illnesses and stuff, you know, helping with, you know, helping out the church and whatnot. And so when Wildcat gets surrounded and he's fighting off all these men, these assassins for the Roman emperor, or like his foot soldiers even, Knight Commander Scott basically says, you know, what has this man done wrong? And they basically start attacking Scott and Scott's like, oh, you want to, and, and, Scott just basically looks at him like, oh, hell no, bitch. And then all of a sudden, a giant brawl happens. Hmm. And then you got, and then you got Sir Garrick. All their asses, pretty much. Hmm. Oh, no. It would have this, and then, and then after that, then more guards would come in. And then Sir, Ger and then Sir Garrick would see this. And, and then he would join into the fight. And then finally, Paladin Fate would see all this going on. And he would be like, you know, gentlemen, stop. He's like, gentlemen. You know, stop fighting. And then he'd be like, stop, and shoot like a giant shock wave, and it would just like blow both parties back. And then all of a sudden, the soldiers would try to attack him, and then Paladin Fate would just would just a way would just pull like a Gandalf, like do uh, you shall not pass one, where he slams his staff down, and he causes like this giant, almost kind of like mystical shock wave that just like takes just like almost wipes out like fifty or eighty dudes at once. Hmm. Would Ted but, still train Black Canary in this uh, continuity? Um, uh, we have still yet to talk actually, about Actually, yes. He would, and actually, the funny thing that you bring that up, because when he was still a famous Roman gladiator, when Lord, when Lord Wayne was traveling the world, you know, learning all these different techniques and stuff, that, you know, Thaddeus Grant, you know, being one of the best, you know, fighters in the Roman arena, he actually... He actually helped, you know, train Lord Wayne, you know, in, like, arena fighting. Hmm. 
So okay. and also and and that also there was a young lady that worked alongside Lord Wayne. You know, there was be a young lady working alongside her, which of course would be Miss Lance. Yeah. Now, I though I don't know how you would exactly come up with her medieval origins, but yeah, Black Canary and and Batman would basically in this continuity be working, you know, side by side with each other, being trained by Ted. So yeah, I would still keep that in continuity. Okay. Oh, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, I think. I don't know. You kind of see like the beginnings of the JSA, basically, like a nod to yeah. it. Yeah. I was going. I'll say. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Ian. I was about to say. Um, I was thinking about a back, a possible backstory for Vixen. Ooh, go mm. ahead. This okay. I got to hear this. I'm thinking that maybe Vixen's uh, backstory could be kind of similar to that of Storm from the X-Men, but she wouldn't be revered as a goddess, but she would sort of be she would be sort of like an African bounty hunter, and her uh, and she would start out as like a poor, poverty-stricken uh, villager. And then she would, uh, you know, she would encounter this, she would, uh, her grandmother would sort of be like this gypsy, this sort of shaman that spoke to all these different animal spirits and that she was completely in tune with nature. Like she, like every, she believes, she sort of had this Tao, Taoist type approach that she believes that if she only does what is completely necessary in life, then Nature will run its course. All the animals will do what they need to do when all of us humans will do the same. She has that really Tao-type philosophy that allows her to be perfectly in tune with nature, and because of that, she's fucking powerful as hell. And because of that, she, whenever she's about to die, she transfers all of her power and all of her uh, natural spirit and energy into this amulet she gives to her granddaughter, Mari, I believe that's uh, Vixen's real name, Mari, right? Yes. Yeah. She transfers like all of her, all of her skills and all of her natural abilities into the am into this little amulet, this little comma shaped amulet. And the way that it trans, the way that it sort of gets, the way that Mari sort of inherits all these powers is that she's able to use her grandmother's perfect perfect tuned senses to adopt the skills of any animals li that are nearby. Mainly like she, what she does in the regular DC universe is that if there are any animals nearby, like a, like a rhino or a giraffe or a snake, she's able to absorb like their strengths. And like if she's, let's say if she absorbs the strength of a gorilla or something, then she's able to like gr just grab a dude and literally just crushes fucking vertebrae because she just ah. absorbs the natural strength of a gorilla. That's sort of how ah. she did. and she and she even she adopt she adapts so well to this amp to this amulet that she's that she's no longer limited to the range of how close the nearby the, the nearest animal is, that she can basically absorb the strength of any any animal on the continent that she's on. So if it's Africa or Europe or America or anything like that, she can basically pick whatever animalistic power she would want as long as the animal exists on that continent. And yeah, I she, like that. Yeah, and she could basically yeah. she could travel across Europe and sort of be like a. And she should. She could be like a. I don't know a a beauty. Like a beauty fashion designer or something, you know, sort of playing up to her role in the regular DC universe as a supermodel. But then she would just later go on to being a bounty hunter, traveling all across Europe and Africa. Nice. Actually, while I'm thinking of it, because I did mention it mention it while ago, um, my version of Metamorpho. Basically, Sir Mason Rex, because he's called Ma Rex Mason in the regular continuity, I would switch it around and call him Sir Mason Rex. He would be a treasure hunter and kind of like, uh, you know, kind of the average pretty boy, you know, very hunky, but he would be a treasure hunter and like kind of like a thrill seeker. And so he would be looking for the Philosopher's Stone and that he would end up finding one of the many fakes of it and that he accidentally steps on a trap pedal and is scratched by a dart. 
However, this dart had enough poison in it that it basically numbed his arm, and so he basically drops this fake philosopher's stone, which was actually an alchemaic explosive that, when it basically hit the ground and exploded, it basically transmuted him, and instead of actually killing him, it transmuted him into this kind of really, like, shall we say, deformed humanoidish monster, and that he f and that basically he could take he could basically become any element that he wanted to he was like a living alchemy esque creature you know he could if he he could turn one hand into iron he could turn his whole body into iron he could turn one arm into sulfuric acid while the other could be like water or something like really play up the fact that he's the element man and yeah. he would bit and that he would basically win the hearts of the people but that the papal like the papal people would think that he is basically a demon. So he has to basically lay low for a while, and so that's when he would join the outsiders. And basically, for Katana, to basically make it short and sweet, she is she's not only Bushido's sister in this continuity, but she would also be a but she would also be a princess and that she would take this ancient sword that if too much blood is spilled by it, then it starts draining very slowly the life energy of its user, its wielder. Kind of like the sword in the PS2 version of Shinobi. So the, so the sword can basically be a gift because it can, you know, cut through nearly almost anything, but it's a curse that if too much blood is spilled, it has the potential to drive its user mad or basically kill its, you basically have a vampiric effect on its user. But I want to actually get into my interpretation of how I would do Firestorm. Because the way I would do Firestorm is that I would take Jason, I can't really pronounce his last name at the moment, but the third and current Firestorm in continuity, you know, the black version of Fire, the black version of Firestorm, I would take Jason, who would be like a young, kind of like Squire. He just, he just became a knight. And then I would take this German alchemist slash scientist named Sir Martin Stein. And Stein would be creating this big alchemaic experiment. It would be the greatest alchemaic experiment in the world. And basically these pure, you know, like Christians that believed that alchemy was the work of the devil, they would basically sabotage this alchemy experiment and that basically this huge explosion happens. And that rather than, you know, killing Stein and Jason, it transmutes them into one being, a being made somewhat of pure fire, and that, and that basically he would he would call himself Lord Firestorm, or they would call themselves Lord Firestorm, and that basically their armor would look kind of like would we had kind of have that amberish glow, kind of like Lex Luthor's armor look from the Superman Black Ring like that variant cover of Lex, like their armor would, mm -hmm. look, would look very similar to that. It would have that amber look to it. And that it, he could shoot like these alchemic transmute, transmutive blasts, like he could turn arrows into flowers and like bows into like water snakes or some stuff like that. And that basically he would be able to create just out of the air like, you know, swords and shield and stuff made out of like, you know, pure alchemic like fire energy or something. And that, and that the way that they would turn into Firestorm, this I thought was a pretty, to me, kind of interesting idea, is that on Stein's left hand, he would have one half of the symbol, and on Jason's right hand, he would have the other half of the symbol, and that they would have to be really close to each other, unlike where they could just think about it and they could turn into it. For, St for Stein and Jason, they would have to clap each other's hand, you know, hands together, the hands that have the mark, and then they would yell firestorm and the symbol would basically the alchemic symbol would activate and this transmutive energy would basically morph them into firestorm and that was kind of my unique way of making them you know become firestorm hey, you know, uh, combine zip did you have an yeah. idea for atrocitus oh um you know i think i would need to i think i'm going to leave it for another video cuz i got to take it out i want to really really write it out and uh talk about it in another video but okay. i was thinking about other characters like anti monitor and hawk and dove um but actually yeah. i got an idea for hawk and dove 
Um, real quickly... I'm going to use the male and the female one, not the, the two males. Uh, because see, my version, I was going to take Karadok, the Gentle Knight, and Brian Kent, the Silent Knight, and I would make them that version of Hawk and Dove where, you know, Kent would be, you know, as the Silent Knight, he would be a mute, whereas Karadok would be this big, you know, gentle giant. But, uh... And... <coughs> And that, you know, that would kind of be, like, my interpretation of it. Like, I would alter them to where they would basically be that version of Hawk and Dove. But anyway, you know, I, I think we've, what, we've been sitting here chatting long enough, and I think all of our brains practically are fried and noodled at this point. Yeah, I think we should definitely do a part three, though, because, like I said, I'm thinking about characters like Anti-Monitor, uh, Man-Thing, I mean, uh, Swamp Thing, and atrocity so i'm gonna really think those out and um i'm gonna talk about those next time yeah but yeah i mean i mean yeah because jonah uh, hex so many characters i mean it's endless well i don't know about jonah hex but you know they're but i mean yeah pretty much um yeah i'm gonna have to ponder a lot more characters (laughs) and write them down of course yeah 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 i i would say that pretty much I, I feel kind of slightly bad because I feel like I've practically, oh, excuse me, that I've practically just like dominated this whole entire like, this whole entire like, video. Well, I mean, I kind of dominated the last video, so I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to sound. I don't want to sound pretentious or anything, but that's just the way it, it looks. It, like. it's, I mean, three heads are better than one, so, I mean, whoever Yeah, that is true. Like you said, you had more time to think up on more ideas, and I didn't because of school and whatnot, but yeah. Well, see, for me, it's like when I when I was at work, I was thinking and doing my job at the same time, so that's kind of, I don't know, I guess you can say that I multitasked a lot and just, like, gave it a lot more thought. But anyway, guys, we're sitting here, we're all rambling, but... Um, let us know what you think in the comments below and whatnot. Yeah. You know, do you, know, do, do, you do you guys want to see a part three, possibly a part three, or you know, I um, mean, just rate, comment, subscribe, yeah, all that, all, yeah, like all that yeah. stuff. Offer yeah, more ideas because I know that I got there were a few ideas I got from reading the comments on the first video. So yes, definite. Yeah, like definitely, yeah. like. Like, you know, de- definitely keep giving us suggestions, guys, and we'll definitely keep trying to think of ways to explain it. Like, I think in the third video next time, one of the comments that was left, um, try to think of, of ways to introduce Jonathan Crane into continuity, like a medieval scarecrow. Yeah, because some, yeah, somebody was uh, talking about that last time, which that yeah. would be really interesting if it's done right. Yeah, like, like that and Killer Croc and... Maybe like come up with an idea for Parasite and Mongol and stuff. Yeah, but, we didn't even touch on Catwoman and all those, but yeah. Yeah, we didn't even touch on Catwoman and all them, but you know, we'll save that for the potential third video. But anyway guys, you know, um I am done, Zip is done, and Ian is pretty much done. So we're so that's pretty much it for this second video. And hope you guys enjoyed it, and hopefully you guys will be able to sit through all of us just sitting here, you know, I guess being, <laughs> I guess being us is the way that I would kind of phrase it. But take care, everyone. All right. This is F.W. Yeah. Waller signing out. Zip. This is Gory Knight. I'm bye. Goodbye. Yeah. Later.